many of you have had an out-of-body experience? Hands up. Well, that's about 15%, maybe even 20%. Good, that's about what I would expect. Um, it's perhaps slightly on the high side because you've come to a lecture on out-of-body experiences. But even the most you know, ordinary, talking about something else audience will probably you know, usually come up with about 10%. So this is not an unusual experience. What I want to consider today, because of the topic of this day, um, and the previous lecture, which I much enjoyed, um, is whether out-of-body experiences are or can be spiritual experiences. What is the relationship between thinking you're out of your body and anything we might call spiritual? So let's have a go at that. I want to begin with one of my greatest heroes, William James. Um, he was the, a psychologist working at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. He had the most wonderful ideas, which then Freud came along and ruined everything <laughs> with the unconscious and the ego and the subconscious and all these things which just have failed again and again. They're popular, they're the way we feel about our minds, but actually they're wrong. They don't connect up with anything to do with how the brain works. <laughs> uh, if, if that hadn't happened, perhaps some of, of James's ideas, we'd have got to spirituality and psychology a lot quicker because he was already talking about that. Now, um, he, he, probably most of you will know this absolutely famous, famous quote. Um, and this was after he'd breathed nitrous oxide. Um, uh, in the previous lecture, you heard about how this was, was coming up with a change in chemistry and people, Humphrey Davy uh, was one of the main ones taking nitrous oxide in those days. And James came to the conclusion that, and his impression of its truth has, has remained unshaken, that it is our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. I hope that all of you may have had some glimpse of through the filmy screen. He did it with nitrous oxide. Now that is a really simple chemical. It's three atoms. NO2, um, and yet it has a, a, an important role in the brain. And it can have a most extraordinary effect. How many of you have, have had um, nitrous oxide recreationally? Oh, quite a few. How many of you had it like childbirth or something like that? Oh, I should have put my arm both up. <laughs> Any women had it in childbirth? It's very different then because the same it is with heroin and, and, and morphine and so on. If you're in, if you're in pain, you don't get the... The, the psychedelic effects. But what happened to William James was, um, and it happened to many, many, many people, is a kind of switch. So you may, in your ordinary state of consciousness, this side of the filmy screen, um, think that the world is made of matter. And then suddenly you, you breathe in some <laughs> nitrous oxide, and the world is made of thoughts. Hmm, odd. Ah, just like, breathe it in. It wears off about a minute later. Which is more spiritual? Hmm. I'm going to be. Uh, thank you. I'm going to be asking you lots of questions, um, and it's nice when you answer. I've just been at an amazing conference on psychedelics in Estonia, and I was like, "How many people think you know? What do you think of that?" <laughs> and then someone said, "We're Estonians. We don't answer in lectures." Oh, okay. So great to be back in, they did eventually, I forced them. Anyway, good to be back in England where people actually respond. Um, <laughs> so, um, if you think the world is made of matter, then you have a problem with consciousness. Materialism, which is the dominant view in science, although not the only one, um, just can't handle consciousness. How can what's going on in a physical brain give rise to this experience? But if you go the other way and go to idealism, everything's made of thoughts, you can't account for matter. Why should it be that we could agree? I mean, you probably all agree with me that I'm up here, you're over there, this is a computer screen, and so on. But if it's just our thoughts, and one of the whole problems of consciousness, I can't get to your experience, I can't get to your interiority, so how can we agree about anything? So neither of these really works, hence the great mystery of consciousness, which is not what I'm going to talk about today. I am going to talk about out-of-body experiences. Now, one of the things that really gets me annoyed is the way people um, ask 
you know, if things real or not real. There's an excellent book that I am um, just read um, on psychedelics. Um, and he asks these kind of questions. How can you be sure he's talking to people who've had psychedelic experiences with LSD or magic mushrooms or DMT or whatever? How can you be sure this was a genuine spiritual event and not just a drug experience? And a dr or a drug experience, interesting and pleasurable, but signifying nothing. There's this tendency to um, divide things up in what I think is an extremely unhelpful way. Um, you get this um, in out-of-body experiences all the time. I just picked up a few uh, news headlines, um, particularly uh, impressed with The Economist, out of your mind, not out of your body. <laughs> Very funny. Um, major breakthrough as scientists confirm out-of-body experiences are real. Now, what do they mean by real? They mean something actually left the body, which, of course, is an empirical question whether it does or not. Um, so everyone who's had one which didn't leave their body is not real? I don't blah, blah. And uh, are they spiritual or neurological? What would you say? Both. 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 Sorry, what were you going to say? I agree with that. What, you agree that it's got to be one or the other? then I disagree with you. I mean, you're perfectly at liberty to think it's got to be one or the other, um, but I would go along with the person who said both. So um, we can find out. We can find out in, in both cases. Do, do we consider it spiritual? Do we consider it neurological? But opposing them from the outset is not very helpful. Nor is it, you know, is an out-of-body experience a mere hallucination? Well, of course, in a sense, it's a hallucination. There are many people in psychology now saying, well, or, or, all experiences are hallucination. It's just the degree to which they agree with the world. You may have seen the TED lecture by Anil Seth. If you haven't, that's great on that topic, that all of experience is hallucination. So these are ways I do not want to think about out-of-body experiences. I return to William James, who talks about how these experiences are so available. But he ends up asking this question. How to regard them is the question. This alone makes him, him a hero of mine because he's not saying, are they this or are they that? He's got a perfectly open mind. He's had psychedelic experiences. He's, ha he's glimpsed through or even moved right through to the other side of the filmist screen. And his question now is not one of those crude questions. It is, how do we regard them? And that is what I'm going to consider today. I'm going to consider this with respect to an experience that I had myself, and I do apologise. How many of you are a bit sick of hearing about this experience because you've read about it before? Oh, not too many. You're being polite. Um, <laughs> it's, there's quite a lot of um, uh, videos, and I've written about it in, in two books, <coughs> but I'm glad if, it's, if, if any of it is, is new to you. Because it's a bit weird to have an experience in 1970 and then still be talking about it in 2018. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that this experience has actually shaped my entire life. If it hadn't been for this experience, I wouldn't have done the science I've done. I wouldn't have given up all the sensible things I was intending to do before I had this experience <laughs> um, and lived such a weird life. <sighs> so that's how my mum liked me to look, only she'd tell me to tie my hair back and look neater. Uh, this is how I preferred to look back in 1970. This was the, the tail end of the hippie era. It was so exciting. I went up to university and I know it's all absolutely thrilling. And um, uh, in my first term, uh, well, um, a man turned up in my room. I'd signed up for lots of things in um, Freshers' Fair. And um, a man turned up in my um, knocked on my door one morning and he said, you signed up for the Psychic Research Society. Um, but um, I'm the only member left from last year. Would you like to start it up again with me? And I looked at this guy, and he had long, long, long wavy hair and bright sparkly eyes and looked so super cool. And he was a second year, and I thought, yes. <laughs> so, so I started running the Psychic Research Society with him. And one night, uh, it was early November uh, in 1970, we had a Ouija board session which I don't recommend because you can get yourself into psychological, you know, yeah, you can. So I, I, I'm not recommending it, but on the other hand, we did it. So we sat there with a table and a glass in the middle and letters round and, oh, the spirit's there and, you know, and it's spelling out messages, you know. Now, I mention this 
you will understand later, but I mention this because having your arm going like this is very disturbing to your body schema, to your sense of where your arm is. And also when, like me, you were extremely sleep deprived because it was all so thrillingly exciting. I was staying up till four in the morning, either playing Monopoly or arguing about quantum mechanics or something, you know, um, getting up for nine o'clock lectures. So I was very, anyway, and then I'm doing all of this. And then I'd promised to go up to a friend's room and, and have a spliff. Um, and um, so that's what we did. And what? As one does. As one does, as one does indeed, and certainly <laughs> did then. Um, and um, I sat down on the floor, cross-legged on the floor, listening to some music. Any guesses what music? Hendrix. No, it wasn't. I, it might could have been Hendrix, but it probably was. What did you say? You said Pink Floyd. Uh, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure it would have been either Pink Floyd or Grateful Dead. Um, so there I am listening to the music and really, really tired and thinking I really ought to go to bed. Um, and I was going down a tunnel. I was going down a, a tunnel of trees. This is a, a, a simple drawing I did a few days later when I'd recovered. <laughs> um, and it was like um, perhaps being on a horse or in a horse-drawn carriage because there was the noise. It was like kind of noise, you know? Uh, and all these leaves flashing past like an autumn tunnel of a road, you know, towards a light. Now, this is 1970. The term near-death experience wasn't invented until 1985, um, in, um, 1975, in um, the first ever book about near-death experiences by Raymond Moody. And so I'd never heard of tunnel experiences at all, had no idea, this just happened to me. Um, and then uh, one of my friends said to me, would you like some coffee? And there was absolutely no way I, you know, in this tunnel I could answer, so I didn't answer. And she said, no, 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 and went off outside to the corridor to do the coffee. And my other friend, Kevin, said, where are you, Sue? And I was like, um... I, I really didn't know where I was. I can't say I'm in a tunnel. I don't know where I... I must remember I'm in Vicky's room. Oh, um... Uh, and, as I try, uh, and as I was sort of drifting, and th suddenly everything became clear. It became so clear, I had the impression that this was vision clearer than any vision I've ever had in my life. And there I am, apparently on the ceiling, looking down and looking at Kevin, me, Vicky out in the corridor. I could see through the walls, but it, otherwise it was quite, you know, sensible looking. And... I think, from what I know now, that if it hadn't been for Kevin constantly asking me questions, that would have been the end of that. Because most out-of-body experiences are very brief. People get frightened, or they start to think about where they are, or think about their body, or they move, and they're back. But Kevin said, oh, have you got an astral cord? What could you do now? Can you move? Can you get out of the room? And on and on and on. And the result was that I did. I went up through another room, um, uh, out of the roof, and started flying around the roofs of Oxford. I was determined, uh, even then, to um, see if I could see anything that I could check the next day. So I very carefully looked at all the roofs and the chimneys and the gutters and stuff before I went flying off. Now, I won't bore you with my travels, because they were in retrospect, not very interesting. I tried to go to all kinds of places. But I suppose what was more interesting was that I started with what seemed like a complete duplicate body joined by a silver cord to the body down there. And then uh, after some time, and the whole experience was more than two hours, after some time, I lost that and became uh, different shapes, a huge flat sheet, a tiny speck, um, uh, odd shapes. I mean, it, it, it became malleable. Um, and I tried to come back twice. The first time I came back, I thought, fine, it's OK. Things looked a bit weird by now, but you know, at least I can come back. And then I went off again. And the second time when I came back, um, what happened was, um, and it's very interesting that I can still remember this. Partly, it's probably some false memories. I mean, because I've told the story quite a lot, both to myself and others, I've probably solidified some parts of it. Mm. Um, possibly inaccurately, but I did write down as much as I could um, two days later when I was able to write again. Um, and I've also got my diary, which I wrote <coughs> as well. Um, I, came, I tried to come back into the body, and now when I came back, the whole room was looking really odd, and my own body was kind of like, it didn't have a head on, it had a jagged neck, it was really, everything was very weird. Nevertheless, I was sure that I had to get back in there. So I went inside, and I got too small, and... I was sort of moving around inside the body, thinking, this is all wrong. I now know this is called internal heurtoscopy, but I didn't know that then either. I didn't know anything about any of these things. So I thought, well, I've got to get bigger. 
So I tried to get bigger and I got bigger and bigger, but I wasn't the right shape. And I tried to make myself the shape of a body, but I couldn't, despite what I'd been doing up until then. And I couldn't manage it. And I just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I really started to expand. And I didn't know anything about that as an altered state of consciousness either. And I just got bigger and bigger and I went into the earth and the sky and then the moon came in and planets and then poof. I think even then I was reflecting that this was something like my rather primitive idea of cosmology um, as, as much as I knew in those days. But that was a sort of plas passing thought. The most extraordinary thing was this. I got to the point where I couldn't get any bigger. I had the impression that I was expanding at the speed of light, but you don't go anywhere then. <laughs> and time and space, it was the first time in my life that I'd had an experience in which time and space drop away. And there are things happening, but they're not happening in a conventional framework of time and space. And there was no distinction between myself and everything else. Basically, I was everything, everything was me. Ah. I didn't know anything about mystical experiences of oneness either in those days. And then Kevin said, well, there's got to be something more. What's next? Or something like that. And I, you know, was, was kind of dragged out of a wordless state and thought, well, there can't be anything more. And then there was this extraordinary kind of a struggle that I had of um, almost like, but it's only a metaphor, really, struggling through clouds. And that there opened up a sense of something or someone benign looking at me either one eye or millions of eyes, or just a sense of, of being observed by something benign and slightly amused by how tiny I was, something like that. And then, and then a long, long struggle to get back, which really was, I would interpret it now, as a long struggle to reinstate the illusion of self that we all live by. To say, you have got to go back inside the body and look out through the eyes. If you want to go anywhere, you've got to take the body with you. And that seems so, you know, when I've just been, you know, going, anyway, the idea of that lump down there, I've got to take it with me. And um, you know what made it happen in the end? What do you think would force you to take the body with you? Well spotted. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I, you know, in all these attempts to get back when I was like drifting about the room and every time I looked anywhere, I'd sort of go there and then there's a bot and I thought, you, you've got to do this. You know, Victoria's cross with you enough because uh, you haven't answered her and you're, you're keeping her up and all that. You know, you've got to get out of here. So I did. And then Kevin said, because he knew about, you see, he was a second year and he was, you know, the head of the Psychic <laughs> Research Society and he knew about astral projection. And he said, if you go to sleep now, your astral body will leave and never come back and you'll die so I've got to keep you awake so he kept me awake um, all night which as far as I know is the only time I've ever managed to stay awake all night so you can imagine by the next day I was a pretty weird state and I went off to, lec to a lecture and my bicycle was and my body were over there and I was going along like this and I thought I'm not gonna fall off my bike but anyway it was fine <sighs> and then I had a tutorial in which did you have your eyes open or closed at that time? when sorry when uh, closed. closed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I opened them in the attempt to get back. At that very last stage, I opened them, and, and, and then I'd sort of zoom out again, and I'd shut them again, try and concentrate, and you know, and it, 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 that was part of the job. It's an interesting question because that was part of the job to be able to open my eyes without pff, everything flipping, which I'm, in, in the end was okay. Can you just tell us why it's called astral body? Oh, astral only means of the stars. And um, I think the idea of astral projection is that, you know, you project beyond boring earth and go to the stars. But I don't really know the origin of it. It comes in theosophy from the uh, Madame Blavatsky and all that. So that is a slightly long rendition of the experience. But I want to use this experience to raise this question. And perhaps we can, you know, have a discussion and, and, and think about it of whether these kind of experiences can be considered spiritual. And if so, in what way and, and what that might mean. So that's the, the, the starting point. Um, now, the philosopher Thomas Metzinger, who works a lot on consciousness, um, said, uh, has written, you know, for anyone who had that kind of experience, it's almost impossible not to become an ontological dualist. That's precisely what I did. An ontological dualist is somebody who believes, uh, like Descartes, in two kinds of, kinds of stuff, mind and matter. Uh, René Descartes, uh, 17th century French philosopher, 
much derided for Cartesian dualism, but I remember what a, a seeker he was, what a thinker. He was asking himself, his, his meditations, his book called The Meditations, is, is all asking difficult questions. You know, who am I? How does it work? How does the brain work? He was one of the first people to think of the, of the body as a machine and to think of nerves taking uh, signals along them. But then where do they go? You know, we still can't really answer that. So he, he would say, um, you know, that light comes in uh, and into the eyes and then it goes to the pineal gland. Where, pun? It's just the pineal gland, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it goes to the, the, the pineal gland, which he chose as, because it's, it's one of the few structures, there's only one of it in the brain. You know, most of it's, as you know, two hemispheres. Um, because he could not solve the problem, which I started with at the beginning. We can't solve the problem of consciousness uh, at the moment. Um, how, how this relates to this? Very, very difficult. So his idea was there really are two stuffs. Two su that ontology means what exists. So for him, there was in existence mental things and physical things. But the, the, the problem of this, I mean, it's absolutely obvious what the problem is. There are lots of problems, but the main one is how the two would interact. How on earth could actual light signals and, you know, whatever, in the eyes suddenly turn into the experience of red or the experience of, I don't know, how, what you feel like sitting on the chair that you're on at the moment. Um, it, it, it didn't work then and it doesn't work now. But does it seem like this to you? Do you feel as though you are inside your body? Does it feel like you're inside your body? Does it feel something like this? I mean, do you feel... You yeah, I know you can't, can't detect the, the, the comfy chair inside your head and the speakers, but, but do you feel in some way that you are inhabiting your body, that you're inside the uh, head looking out through the eyes and that you have the, you know, you are in control. If you want to raise your arm, you can do it. If you want to pull the lever. Yes? Hands up who feels something like that most of the time. Okay, so that's a, it's, a, it's a common way that we feel. Now, many, uh, um, the, throughout most of um, the, the history of thought, people have thought, well, it is like that. There is somebody in there. But modern neuroscience it tells us that there can't be anybody in there. This is a version, if you like, of Dan Dennett's Cartesian theatre. And what he meant by the Cartesian theatre was, he was saying, you know, everybody in consciousness studies uh, doesn't believe in Cartesian dualism, but they still maintain this kind of idea that we're in there, there's a me in there, and there's a kind of mental screen on which my experience, and we have a stream of consciousness and, and a, 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 a stream of experiences that we are consciously having, and then there's a whole lot of other stuff that's unconscious. But then its point was, when you discard Cartesian dualism, you really must discard the show that would have gone on in the Cartesian theatre, that's all our experiences, and the audience as well, because neither the show nor the audience can be found in the brain, and that is the only real place there is to look for them. Now, there are many people who would disagree. People who believe in endless consciousness, expanded consciousness, consciousness be beyond the brain and all of that would say that the brain isn't the only place to look for them. So this is just one view. But the point that he's making is that we know the brain does not have a central headquarters. It isn't constructed that way. We know that perception is not a question of having pictures in the head. If you had pictures in the head, you'd need somebody to look at the pictures in the head and that person would need to have pictures in their head and you have the whole homunculus problem and an infinite regress. It, it, it doesn't work. Now, I don't want to go into an entire lecture on consciousness, but that's, that's very much the, the, the starting point for that. Psychology has also been able to show that we start out very young as dualists. Kids of... Um, three and four are already separating living from non-living things. Uh, even much, much younger infants, tiny babies, um, distinguish between things that move themselves and things that are pushed. And by the time you're five or six, little kids are saying things like, it's my brain, and my brain helps me do things, and my brain helps me think. But it's me, not my brain, that has feelings and loves my mummy and stuff like that. So these are very, very natural distinctions. So be being a Cartesian dualist is a kind of ordinary state of what people are like. And um, to give it up requires throwing out a lot of intuitions. 
The other thing, of course, is that religions utterly, most religions, sorry, the monotheistic <coughs> religions depend utterly on the concept of having a soul or a spirit. They couldn't play their vile tricks if they didn't. Um, they, all these millions of people would not be going um, to religious ceremonies if they were not convinced of the, the existence of a soul or a spirit. Um, the whole idea, the, the nasty meme tricks, um, I mean, I think of religions as, as meme plexes. The nasty meme tricks, the, the most powerful meme tricks that they play involve saying, well, you've got a soul, obviously, and uh, if you behave in a certain way on earth, you'll go to heaven, and if you behave in a certain other way, mm -hmm. you'll go to hell. And they have very nasty ideas of what's going to happen to you in hell. You'll be burnt alive and, you know, whatever. And the same thing is, is true in Islam. Um, the, uh, you are a precious God-given soul, and that's the way that um, Allah is able to have power over you, or the idea of, and all the instructions that you're given. They wouldn't work if you didn't, if you weren't a dualist. So actually giving it up is important if, you're going to, if you want to give up being trapped by um, nasty religions. Um, Buddhism alone, or at least some versions of Buddhism, uh, not all, reject this. And I think the Buddha really was doing this right from the start. He was rejecting some of the proto-Hindu kind of ideas about Atman and the soul and so on. And basically developing the idea of anatta or, or no self. Which doesn't mean there is no such thing as a self, as far as I can understand it at any rate, because he said different things to different people. But as, as my understanding is, <coughs> it means that the self is an illusion, it's not what you thought it was. And I think this fits very well with the neuroscience. The self is a construction of the brain. It's a story the brain is telling itself. It's a, it's a representation of a self that doesn't really exist. So that representation has effects, important effects, making us selfish and greedy and all sorts of other things am amongst all, all of it. Um, I, I'll just give you one of my absolute favorite quote um, from the early sutras um, of what the Buddha said. Actions exist and also their consequences but the person that acts does not. And the, the Zen endeavor, at least, because I can speak more about Zen after 35 years of Zen training, and I'm not a Buddhist, by the way. I'm not going to sign up to any religion, as you can probably gather from the kind of things I say about religions. Um, but the practices can be very powerful. Um, the consequences of this go very deep, and they are to giving up the sense of being somebody who acts, of being somebody with with consciousness and free will. Those have to drop away in, in the practice. A, a quite a lot here, but this is all kind of leading me to the fact that the astral projection, of course, <coughs> makes, in this context of what I've been talking about, makes perfect sense if you have an out-of-body experience and you feel as though you've left your body. The obvious, the obvious, obvious answer um, is to think that your spirit or soul or astral body has departed from the physical and gone somewhere else. And you will find this. I mean, I love all these things. I just put together a whole mishmash of stuff I found uh, on the web. I especially like this, um, <coughs> this blue powder, astral projection blue powder. Um, and then, of course, there are all the paranormal claims. Um, you can go to the present or the future or the past if you astrally project. And I expect if you buy all these discs, you can do even more psychic powers. There's all sorts of psychic powers down there. And... Um, well, you can go and do these things. Actually, some of them have very sensible advice on how to have an out-of-body experience, but, but most of them are dr nevertheless dressed up in, in this. And I want to get away from making assumptions about this and have a much more open mind about what on earth might be going on in out-of-body experiences. So, um, where we've got to so far, I've told you about this experience. I've... I've suggested the problems with dualism that suggest to me that um, one can't, um, uh, uh, one mustn't necessarily think about it in terms of something leaving the body. I would say it's an open question. So I would like to know what you think about it. Um, now, we are going to have a couple of breaks because this is a very long session. So I'm going to give you five minutes, <coughs> or roughly five minutes, and I would like you to talk to your neighbour, please, either just a couple of people or three or whatever's convenient in where you're sitting because we haven't time to go off anywhere else and just discuss with your neighbour or with anybody what you think happened 
in that experience. Well, clearly you didn't have any great trouble in discussing things. Um, in a very crude way, I am just going to ask for hands up for three possibilities. Um, something left, something didn't, or don't know. Um, okay, how many of you think that something left the body? How many of you think that something left my body during that experience? Like an astral body or a spirit or soul or something. Okay, there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, roughly 24. Okay, how many think that nothing left the body? Uh, probably about half the audience. Okay, hands up who didn't put their hands up. Why not? Oh, you don't know. That's not a very good answer. How about you? Because I've had had sleep paralysis. I've had an out-of-body experience. Ah. And I know that there is a scientific basis of sleep paralysis. Yeah. But in the time we're feeling it, it's so real. Yes. And I thought I was possessed 200 years ago. Yes, you would. You would. Could you all hear that? She was talking... She was talking about sleep paralysis. This is when you wake, typically wake up. It can happen as you're falling asleep, but typically it happens as you wake up. And <coughs> you think you're wide awake. You feel mentally wide awake, but you can't move. Oh. Now, it, how many people have had that? Should be about a quarter of you. Oh, it's about a third. Yeah. Now, <coughs> pun? I was in a coma when this happened. I didn't notice them. And I saw my body in pipes. Uh, can we leave that till later? Sorry. Um, we're not, I was given instructions not to allow questions in between, but anyway. Um, sleep paralysis is very common, as you can tell from here. And the reason is, when you're um, in, dreaming, in REM sleep, which is when you have most of dreams, your, your body is kind of chemically paralysed. There's a chemical disconnect between your motor cortex and the, and the, and the <coughs> spine and, and the muscles. So you can't move. This is so you won't act out your dreams. And this disconnect, this um, uh, should be kept separate from waking. And it can go wrong in two ways. Uh, the paralysis cannot be good enough, in which case you go sleepwalking, or the paralysis can hang on when you've partially woken up. Now, sleep paralysis is very, very interesting because we don't really know whether when you're looking around your bedroom and you're paralysed and you're going like, I can't move, God, it's terrible, I'm going to die, and you've got... You've got screeching noises, are called a kind of noises going on in your head. You've got a feeling that you can't breathe. There's something on your chest holding you down. You've got sexual arousal. There's aliens coming to take my eggs or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, it can be really horrible, um, but it's a it's perfectly normal physiological state. If anyone has it and they don't like it, the best advice is to just relax. It's only sleep paralysis. It'll go away. But when you're in the grip of it, that doesn't help very much. Um, as the, the woman here said, uh, you know, it's so physically absolutely convincing and 200 years ago she would have been um, thought she was being possessed or attacked by the, um, the, um, the, the old mare, the, the hag, the old hag, um, the nightmare, um, uh, the Kanashibari in Japan, the Kokma in Nigeria. I mean, almost every culture has its sleep paralysis myth. And the most recent one in the West is, is alien abduction. Um, but why I go on about this from you having said that is you can turn sleep paralysis into an out-of-body experience quite easily. If you get sleep paralysis, um, then all you have to do is to imagine, just forget about the body and imagine yourself lifting up or imagine yourself rolling out of bed and you, your uh, motor out, outflow, the, all the brain stuff that's going to organise the rolling out of bed, um, will uh, not be able to make you actually roll out of bed. You stay there, but it will split off and you can get into an out-of-body experience. I mean, it's not reliable, but it's one of the best ways of getting an out-of-body experience if you want one. Um, okay, so um, who else didn't put their hand up? Why? Mm-hmm. Teletransporter, yeah. Oh, a hologram. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, yes. Yeah.
Yeah. I'll have to stop you there because um, we can come back and have longer discussions later. Anyway, fair enough. So there are different reasons why you might not have decided. Well, I think it's an empirical question. But at the time, what happened to me was um, the next day I went out to look at the roofs and the chimneys and the gutters and everything. Well, there weren't any chimneys at all on my college roof. And the gutters were not the ancient lead things I'd kind of imagined or seen in my astral projection. Uh, they were modern plastic white ones. <laughs> but you see, there's always a way out of it. So I convinced myself that, um, you know, the astral world is not an exact replica of the physical world and things look different in the astral and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I proceeded to become absolutely convinced of the existence of all sorts of things. I had no way of explaining this experience uh, from the science I was studying. I was doing physiology and psychology. Um, and the only ideas I had were astral projection. And as Thomas Metzinger said, it's natural to jump to these conclusions if you have such an experience. So I decided then and there, age 19, that I'm going to devote myself to parapsychology and to proving to all those closed-minded scientists that they are wrong. And there's more in heaven and earth than ever dreamt of in your philosophy and blah, 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 blah. And I managed to get myself a place to do a PhD and funded myself through it, doing a job and so on, and began all my experiments on telepathy. And I basically, I utterly, after that experience, believed in telepathy and clairvoyance and psychokinesis and precognition and ghosts and poltergeists and life after death and spirit healing and, you know. So I trained as a witch. I learned to read tarot cards quite well. Um, I uh, sat with mediums, uh, physical mediums, mental mediums, uh, and all sorts of uh, um, other kinds of... Um, so-called spiritual um, trainings that I did and I did loads of experiments for my PhD and by the end of my PhD I had this brilliant theory <coughs> the memory theory of ESP that was going to transform our understanding of the mind and um, it was rubbish <laughs> first of all I discovered that that sort of theory um, was, had been around a long time and rejected many times for theoretical reasons. Henri Bergson had a wonderful version of it, the thinkers did too. Um, and then there was the problem that we were beginning to understand how memory does work. I mean, back in 1970, we didn't have very much of a clue. I mean, now, nowadays we can look at dendritic growth and the changes in synapse strength and we can understand a lot about how memory works, but we didn't have a clue then. Um, so it was kind of more forgivable that I had that theory. But the other thing was I devised all these clever experiments to, um, you know, sort of um, crafty, you know, experimental design, clever little experimental designs to test my theory that needed some telepathy or some clairvoyance, and I never found any. And in the first couple of experiments I did, but then I'd done something wrong and I got the stats wrong, and, you know, as soon as I started to do the experiments properly, I found no paranormal phenomena. So... It was very difficult. You have to imagine me with my flowing hippie clothes and my headbands and my dope and my um, you know, um, wonderful beads and all of this stuff, giving tarot readings to all my friends and going, you know what, I don't think there are any powerful phenomena at all. It's all a load of rubbish. But you got your PhD. Yeah, I did get my PhD. I, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. I did get my PhD, and the exa external examiner said, a noble work, a noble work. <laughs> Even though he was really disappointed because he was professor of parapsychology at Edinburgh at the time. And, um, and he, you know, he said, you know, what you've done is, is, was a wonderful series of experiments that builds up, you know, but it, not what he would have liked to see. Not what I would have liked to see. But this is the critical, most central thing about being a scientist that you change your mind in the face of the evidence. So although it was extremely painful at the time, I'm ever grateful for that. Because when I have another brilliant theory about consciousness, which I do from time to time, and then I discover it's wrong, I'm going, okay, I'm used to this. <laughs> <laughs> and all my ideas about memes. You know, I wrote a book called The Meme Machine. Um, most scientists think meme theory is rubbish. Well, I think, I think it's not, I think it's brilliant. Um, it's not me invented it, Richard Dawkins invented it, but um, I can be proved wrong, and that's, that's what science is all about. So I had to do something else, I had to change my mind, and all blah blah, very difficult, and so on. But what I want to do now is to tell you what over the years I've discovered. I will say, first of all, that um, I wrote a book called Beyond the Body, 
published in 1982, which was my best attempt after that failure of parapsychology, was my best attempt to try and explain out-of-body experiences in a naturalistic, psychological way. And I couldn't really get very far. At the time, it was considered a kind of classic work of, of, of trying to do that, but we didn't have the science, and now we do. So what I'm going to do now is tell you something about what we do know um, that can help us understand my experience. So what about the tunnel? This picture here um, is, was done by one of Ron Siegel's subjects that he gave um, LSD to. And you can see it's, a, um, my, it's similar to my tunnel in the sense that it's, you know, it's a tunnel with a light at the end. But it's got all these televisions and things all around the outside, which is, is surprisingly common. That's induced by LSD. Look at this one. In, in, um, oh, sorry, wrong button. Um, uh, a picture that a man called da um, David Howard gave me. He's given me a whole, a whole lot of paintings. He does paintings all the time. Look at how similar that is. It's got that same structure with, it's, you know, they could be television screens. Very, very similar. Um, but produced in different ways. He gets um, frequent episodes of sleep paralysis because of his narcolepsy. And he gets abducted by aliens and they take him through this tunnel off to another planet. Um, I should tell you, he, when he had some medication that really helped, he kind of, he was very much in two minds about, about it because he loved going to these other planets and the medication stopped it. Anyway, why do we get tunnels? You also get tunnels um, in art in many, many cultures around the world, particularly cultures that use psychedelic drugs. You get them on um, textiles and pots and all sorts of things. Um, and lots of people get tunnels on the verge of sleep. How many of you have experienced visual tunnels as you're falling asleep? About a dozen of you. Mm. I get them. Can I also put in the fort and something that you children get? What? <laughs> the what children get? Seriously, all children. Yes. Yes. A fort. Yes. Yes. Yes, they do. Um, adults do, but children more. Yeah. Um, and they get out of body experiences too when they're ill, of course. Now, what do we know about tunnels? Well, it turns out, and it's been known for quite a long time, that it, the answer is very simple, um, but it requires some mathematical modelling. Uh, you, um, all you need to know is that if this represents the outside world, or, or your retina if you prefer, anything that is a circle in the outside world or on the retina is projected onto a straight line. So the way the cortex is built is a kind of columnar organisation and it takes, it's, it's retinotopic in the sense that it maps the retina onto the cortex in V1, primary visual cortex. But it does it in such a way that circles become straight lines. Now one thing we do know is that when you get hyperactivity in the cortex, and this is going to be imp important in several contexts, um, you get lines of spreading activation going along. Now what I mean by hyperactivity is too much activity. So what's happening in the brain is, I mean, <laughs> lots is happening, <laughs> but one fundamental principle is you've got a lot of excitatory neurons that excite the next one they connect to, and you have a lot of inhibitory neurons that inhibit the next one they connect to. And all loads and loads of processes operate to keep everything in balance um, through inhibition. Now, if you take a drug, for example, any of the classical psychedelics that produce disinhibition, then you get hyperactivity. If you are getting close to death and lacking oxygen, uh, the inhibitory cells are more susceptible to oxygen loss, and so you get disinhibition. Um, if you have certain kind of shock through other uh, effects on um, neurotransmitters, you'll get disinhibition. So it, w that's important to trying to understand these experiences. And disinhibition in the visual cortex will produce those circles, and if they get if the circles start to get bigger as the uh, hyperactivity gets stronger, then you will appear to be going down a tunnel towards the end. This is called the, it's, it's one of the four form constants discovered in the 1940s by Kluver, that under these conditions you get spirals, cobwebs, um, tunnels, um, uh, checkerboards, and so on. And those pictures I showed you are a combination of form constants, <laughs> the checkerboard and the tunnel. Um, presumably from that. And in the near-death experience, when you have going towards the bright light, I did a simple court, um, computer simulation a long time ago. You know, if you are in, a, in, if you've got no context and something is, a bright light's getting bigger in front of you, you'll feel as though you're being pulled towards it. 
Um, and typically in a near-death situation, you, you've lost contact with um, sensory contact with your body, um, either through great pain or damage or whatever. So the tunnel is not a mystery at all. Now, what about the out-of-body experience itself? Um, how am I getting on? Right, OK. First of all, I want to be clear about uh, distinguishing it from some other experiences. So it is not, if you, if you look in Wikipedia, and I must get around to learning how to edit Wikipedia and change it, because it calls it autoscopy, but it's not. The trouble is, autoscopy means seeing yourself. So in that sense, it is autoscopy. But normally in, in psychiatry, autoscopy refers to this experience like a doppelganger. So in autoscopy, you, in, in a doppelganger, you know what I mean. Uh, I'm standing here, and I'll see another version of myself there. But I'm feeling myself in my body, and I'm seeing a hallucination of myself in front of me. That's classical autoscopy. Heautoscopy is when you don't know. And that must be even worse, when there seem to be two of you and you don't know which one is you and which is not you. That's very rare, much rarer than autoscopy. And finally, in the outer body experience, which is drawn here with them lying down, just because that's more typical, um, it's quite different. You, the, you know, what you feel you are, is, um, looking, is outside the body looking at the physical body. So it's located there. So don't get them mixed up. Now, I want to start with a definition, because definitions are important. Again, if you look up online, you will find a horrible muddle of astral projection, outer body experiences, and some um, very bad definitions. And outer body experiences is when you leave your body and float around in the, uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, or you get people saying astral projection is when you really leave your body and an outer body experience is when you don't. And I find these all extremely unhelpful. So I want to stick to, uh, this is the version I wrote in my book then, but there are other very, very similar definitions used by the very, very few scientists in the world who actually study outer body experiences. They all take this form. It's an experience in which one seems to perceive the world from a location outside the physical body. Note the seams. That is the important thing. This leaves open the question of whether anything really leaves the body or not. So an outer body experience, it, by definition, is an experience in which you seem to be outside your body looking at the world from there. That describes the experience. Now we can ask, why does it seem that way? Does it seem that way because you really are, or does it seem that way for some other reason? Um, how can we explain it? So starting from that definition, I can tell you some, and I'll just zip through some stuff we know about out-of-body experiences. This Im implies that an out-of-body experience is not and cannot be a psychic phenomenon, like seeing something at a distance. It's an experience. It's the experience of seeming to be out of your body. If it coincides with you seeing something you couldn't possibly have seen, then that is a, that is a psychic experience a psychic phenomenon, uh, but the two aren't necessarily um, the same thing. It's another consequence of it. Now, we can al answer quite easily now, which we couldn't in 1982, a whole lot of very basic questions. So how common are they? Well, actually, it's quite hard to know. There are loads and loads and loads of surveys, but they all have huge problems. But there are several really well done surveys. I did one myself in 1984, where there is um, a proper random survey done, a random sample of a population. And that's quite hard to do, but you will see that they all come up with uh, pretty high answers. These, these are the only ones that, as far as I know, that, that exist. Um, Palmer and Dennis um, took two populations in the same town. The students, 25% had had out-of-body experiences, and the townsfolk, only 14%, which is kind of odd because the students are younger, so they had less time in their life to have one, and we get this, actually, this age phenomenon. Lots of people say they had OBEs as children, but when you ask children, they say they didn't, they don't. So there's very, very, some very odd things going on. Um, Iceland, I mean, this may be Icelandic people are less prone. I mean, I really don't know. And my own survey came up with 12%. But I think the only important thing to note is that it is an ordinary experience available to a lot of people. It's not just a kind of weird thing for... for um, spiritual people or anything else. Most of uh, the experiences happen when relaxing or meditating, usually lying down, although not necessarily. There are some wonderful stories. I particularly like one 
um, Celia Green collected a load of them in a book in 1968, um, of a woman taking her driving test. And she said she was sitting on the roof of the car, making every kind of possible mistake she possibly could, <laughs> and couldn't do anything about it, <laughs> probably because she was so nervous. Uh, the story does not relate whether she passed or not, but I assume not. And I assume she didn't drive the car into off a cliff or we wouldn't have known the story. And this is something when people do have OBEs, when they're awake in normal life, they seem to carry on quite normally. Like a vicar who was giving a sermon and was particularly nervous, and he watched himself from the other end of the church uh, giving the sermon. And afterwards he asked the congregation, or some of them, whether they'd noticed anything odd. And they said, no, no, wonderful sermon, you know. Um, uh, on the verge of sleep, of course, um, and that entails sleep paralysis, and close to death. Obviously, the out-of-body experience is one component of the near-death experience. I'm not going to say, I might mention near-death experiences, but I'm not going to say much about them. But typically, you get tunnels, lights at the end of the tunnel, um, out-of-body experience, going to other worlds, meeting a barrier, and so on. So it's just one component of an NDE. Um, who has them? Well, um, <coughs> these correlations have been found with positive schizotypy, which is a version of schizotypy that, that is closely related to creativity and imagination. Psychological absorption, which is the capacity to become absorbed in a um, film or a book or something like that. Fantasy proneness, um, things like um, having childhood um, companions. How many of you had a, had childhood, you know, imaginary imaginary friends as as a kid? Oh, not very many. Uh, anyway, they are quite, they are quite common, and they're they're correlated with OBEs and um, susceptibility to pattern glare, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, people are often worried by their out of body experiences and think they must be going mad. Um, and this is something that interested me a long time ago, and. Um, so I did a very small study with a, with a small group of um, schizophrenics and I used as a control group patients and they, they were all hospitalised um, for schizophrenia and I used a control group of patients who'd like um, broken their leg or something, nothing to do with um, uh, mental things and the answer was exactly the same. And then very soon after that, Gabbard and Twemlo did a huge study with thousands of subjects and found that the OBEs were typically psychologically very healthy. Uh, does this bother you? Okay, if it bothers you, don't look at it for too long. I will not look at it because it bothers me intensely. Um, weird things happen. Uh, what sort of weird things are happening to any of you? Vibrating. It's moving, it's moving. What did you say? Vibrating, Vibrating moving. What else? Colours. Colours, you've got colours forming. Anything else? It's hmm? brighter. Brighter getting brighter all right right yeah so all sorts of weird things happen but it can be very unpleasant for some people now this is what's called pattern glare and it's tested with a little set of things you have to look at and if you're susceptible to pattern glare then this means that certain frequencies um, you'll be more upset by than others and so it's easy to test but it is thought to be a test of cortical hyperactivity excitability that is you remember I talked about how the tunnel, and I'll come to the OBE later, may be caused by hyperactivity in different parts of the brain. Well, some people have just m more excitable cortex, and I think I'm one of those. I'm very, very susceptible to these things. Um, I'm very susceptible to noise. Um, I never listen to music if I can possibly avoid it, and I try and stay away from noise as much as I can because it gets all... <laughs> now I understand why, because the in inhibition's not working too well, I suppose. Um, and um, uh, it's recently been found that people who have out-of-body experiences are more susceptible. And this would fit with the idea that OBEs may be caused by cortical hyperactivity. Uh, I'm still just asking some basic questions. Are they just dreams? No. I mean, I've had so many oh, boring people say to me, oh, well, they're just a dream. No, they're not just a dream because we know that out-of-body experiences, although they may happen on the verge of sleep, ones that have been tested in the lab have never been in REM sleep. Um, also, they don't feel like dreams. Um, sorry, they're not in REM sleep. They're usually in, they can be in stage one sleep, but they're usually in, in waking, the waking state. And certainly, most people would say that they were wide awake when they had it um, and, and not asleep. Um, uh, also, they don't feel like dreams. People after OBEs 
go, that was realer than real. And most of us wake up after ordinary dreams and go, oh, goodness me, that was rubbish. And why didn't I realise it was a dream? Well, most of us are not lucid uh, most of the time in dreams. Um, lucid dreams are dreams in which you know at the time that it's a dream. How many of you have lucid dreams? Oh, excellent. A lot, gosh, probably more than half. Um, they are closely related to OBEs in the sense that they feel very similar and the same people tend to have them. Uh, they have this feeling of, when you go from an ordinary dream to a lucid dream, everything seems brighter, more realistic, but also you can take control to a much greater extent. Not, not totally always, but you can then go, oh, right, I can fly. And that's a very common response. I have been told that the really, really cool thing to do with a lucid dream is to meditate in a lucid dream. Has anyone done that? Yes, oh, good for you, because I utterly failed. The only time I got close, um, I was, I, I'd become lucid because I was swimming across the estuary in, in Salcombe in Devon in the night, and I thought, this is ridiculous, I wouldn't be doing this. Oh, it's a dream, I'll fly then. And as I was flying over the hills, I thought, oh, no, I'm supposed to be meditating. So I went down to sit and meditate, and that's all I remember. It. Oh, hopeless. <laughs> so, never mind. Um, pardon? Yeah. And then jump through the walls and then go on deeper into my consciousness, into another being, and then kept doing it. Oh, gosh, yes. I, there are all sorts of ways you can play around with these states. If you have the, you know, I, I feel rather feeble. I've had some amazing experiences, but I do not have the control to do that, to jump from dream to another dream. And, or some people can wake up and then just go back into the dream they were having before. There's all sorts of things that people do that are amazing. Anyway, a lot of these things are related. Having lucid dreams, having flying dreams, experiencing other altered states are all um, correlated um, with having OBEs. And I've already mentioned sleep paralysis. I think what I didn't say is this feeling of there's something on your chest and that it's suffocating and you can't breathe is probably because when you're still um, partially in REM sleep, um, your breathing is under automatic control. It it's just goes on regardless and you have no, um, no actual control yourself over the breathing. So if you try to breathe, if you think, oh my God, I'm so frightened, and you sort of expect to be able to, you know, to be breathing faster, <laughs> and you can't, it just going, <laughs> your breathing's just going fine, <laughs> um, it feels as though you're being obstructed. And I think that's the origin of the, the thing sitting on your chest, incubus, succubus, those kinds of scary stories. And, and as some, you mentioned, um, in, in centuries gone by, um, these things were thought to be real and sent from the devil. Um, and you, that you must have done something really, really bad to deserve this. So I want to come to the real question, which is whether something... This is not the real question. I'll come eventually back to James's question. But um, the most obvious technical question is whether anything leaves the body in an OBE. Um, and there are two types of theory. Obviously, it does or it doesn't. And how are we going to find out? Well, Classically, in, in parapsychology, which, of course, I was involved with for a very long time, um, they would ask whether astral bodies can be detected and whether um, you can affect things. And I did a whole lot of tests for about seven or eight years. I had a five-digit number, a word, and some objects um, on the fridge in my kitchen, and anyone who had an outer body experience spontaneously was asked to come and see if they could see them. Now, this is in, in interesting because, you see, it's difficult to do OBE studies in the lab because you can't just get someone and stick them in the lab and go, oh, right, have an out-of-body experience now and we'll put you in a scanner. <laughs> but if you can do this, they can, come, they can have it whenever they like in their own home at night in bed and then come to my kitchen. Um, but of all the people who ever tried it, nobody ever uh, managed to get it right. So that was a, a kind of disappointing. And of all the studies done in uh, parapsychology groups, uh, one particularly thorough study and survey of the studies concluded that overall no detectors <laughs> were able to maintain a consistent responsiveness of the sort that would indicate any true detection of an extended aspect of the self. Uh, I'm just quickly glossing over lots and lots of experiments which are extremely un unhelpful, well, un inconclusive. <coughs> but everything changed. And this is why, after I'd kind of given up, I wrote that book, Beyond the Body, in 1982, and then I went off and did other things, memetics, consciousness studies, all sorts of other stuff, work that I did. 
and I did not ever think I would want to come back to out-of-body experiences again. But I did because of what happened in 2002. A paper in Nature, arguably the, the top science journal in the world, Olaf Blanke, a Swiss neurosur neurosurgeon, was operating on a patient, a woman with such severe epilepsy that she was having um, seizures all day long. I mean, just she couldn't have a, a decent life at all. They completely failed to find the focus of the epilepsy. And so they put a, um, uh, a, an array of subdural electrodes. Now, the dura is the skin over the brain. So this is not just under the skull. It's under the skin or uh, right on the brain. Uh, you know, this is not a common opportunity. But he was able then to stimulate, you can see the array roughly depicted here, he was able to stimulate different places um, and different combinations of places. And what he found is when he stimulated gently uh, here in the right temporoparietal junction, she said that her body was becoming distorted. It was getting longer and thinner or her legs were moving. And then when he gave a, a stronger stimulus, she said, I'm on the ceiling looking down. So we know this, you can induce out-of-body experiences by stimulating the right temporoparietal junction. What does it mean? You see, uh, to me, it, it brings me back to the old God spot arguments. Do you remember the whole God spot thing? They discovered a certain spot, very close spot actually, that when people in deep meditation or Carmelite nuns in deep prayer or whatever, this bit of the brain lights up. Well, some people say, well, there you are, you see. Um, spiritual experiences, meditation experiences are a perfectly natural um, um, brain phenomenon. And other people are saying, ah, this is the place through which God communicates with us. Now, you could have exactly the same contrast here with out-of-body experiences. You could say, ah, well, this is the, the hole through which the astral body leaves. This is the so-called astral door. We found the astral door, um, and so on. But what makes one not say that is to know what the TPJ does. And this just comes from Wikipedia. The TPJ is maintaining, amongst other things, is maintaining the body schema. Now, would you all just kind of wriggle a bit like this, please? <laughs> See, it's so easy, you can do it. But you couldn't do that without falling off your chair or hitting somebody by mistake or whatever if you didn't have a body schema, in other words, a representation in the brain of where your arms and legs are, where they're moving, what you're telling it to do, and all of that. It's so natural to us, we don't think about the fact the brain has to create such a thing. Proprioception. Pardon? Proprioception is part of it, that is, you know, it, it's not just proprioception, it's taking in other senses as well, because sight, um, you know, how hard it is to, how long can you stand on one leg with your eyes shut? That's meant to be a test of how old you're getting. Um, and opening your eyes helps an awful, awful lot because you then know where you are. So it's integrating um, touch, sight, proprioception and everything into this representation of where the body is. So, of course, if you disturb it, weird things are going to happen, like your legs getting longer and shorter, um, or your body seeming bigger or smaller, heard of that somewhere, haven't you? Um, and at the extreme, I think that what's happening, uh, not just me, um, what appears to be happening is the brain is, is so determined to keep producing a body schema. It has, it has a kind of body shape from birth. You've got that anyway. Even people who are born with no arms or legs have a complete body schema that does have arms and legs. That's <coughs> intrinsic to us. But if you, if you disturb the ongoing one that is trying to connect with all the senses and the proprioception, um, then it's going to split. It can't any longer keep the, the schema it's got in touch with the feelings that are coming from your body. So it makes perfect sense. How do we know that the body schema uh, that the, the TPJ is doing this. Here's one simple little test. There are loads and loads of ways people know. But what I want you to do is, um, is tell me which hand, left or right hand, is the grey one. So I'm going to shite out um, a letter, um, like C or something, and I want you to say left or right according to which is the left hand. Are you ready? <coughs> B. Yeah. D. Yeah. A. Yeah. C. Very good. Okay, and that, um, you got them all right. I think everyone got them right. Very good audience. Usually there's some completely wrong people. But this, um, uh, when people are doing that sort of a test, you get activity at the TPJ. There are many other ways in which we know. So, that's a kind of um, summary, if you like, of some of the um, 
Um, oh, I've just suddenly realised how little time I've got. Um, uh, of the things we know about OBEs. So are they spiritual experiences? That's such a difficult question. I'm coming back now to James. How do we regard these things? I think it's unequivocal. Personally, and you can disagree, obviously, that out-of-body experiences are caused by hyperactivity in the selfing system of the brain, in particular the, um, the body schema. But remember I started with this awful distinction between uh, are they real or not real? That's, to me, not important. I think the answer is nothing leaves the body, but could they still be spiritual experiences? And to me, the answer is yes. Now, I say yes. I, I, had, I was going to give you a break there, but I've gone too slowly, and we've only had one break, and I was going to have two, but let's see how we get on. What I would like to do now, um, just before I move on to some final experiments, is to demonstrate for you who knows about the rubber hand illusion. Who doesn't know about the rubber hand? Fine, so more of you don't know about it than do. I'm going to have to do this very quickly, but I would like a volunteer, please, to come and have a weird experience. Who would like to have a weird experience? Right, come on then. You can come and sit here. Now, I'm going to give her a wonderfully weird experience. I hope. It doesn't always work, and of course it doesn't always work, particularly in situations where um, you're being watched by... A lot of people. Quite a lot of people. Quite a it? lot of people, yes. Okay, this is a rubber hand. <laughs> now, that is somewhat like your left hand, so I'd like okay. you to put your left hand in there, please, so you can't see it, but okay. it's quite close to the rubber hand, all right? Oh, I'm really excited. Good, that'll help. Uh, now, I want you to put your right hand here. Okay. Okay, right, a bit more forward like that. So, okay. All right. Now, um, I am going to... Uh, stroke the same finger on this rubber hand as I'm stroking on her under here, but she can't see it. I want you to look, I need to line it up a bit better. I want you to look at this rubber hand and feel, concentrate on feeling the stroking. Yeah, I can feel that. Okay, just keep looking at the rubber hand. Why are you smiling? I don't know. Is it just, do you feel quite normal? Yeah, I oh. could, yep, yep. Oh dear. And I'm hoping to give you a wonderful experience. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Feel that. Where do you feel it? In my middle finger. Yeah, and where's that? Oh, my left hand. Yeah, where's your left hand? Ah, it's obviously she's a hopeless subject. I'm kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of felt, felt what something there, like a kind of dissociation from the hand. Might have took a little bit longer. Yes, I think so. If I could devote ten minutes to this, what will happen? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for your bravery. <laughs> if I could devote that to ten minutes, and I'd got it set up really well. Um, what happens is people start to feel as though that is their hand. And it's really very spooky. I've had people go, ah! you know, they just suddenly, it seems to go. Other people, it's very gradual. But it is a, it is a kind of weird, a weird experience. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant partly because it's relevant to all kinds of illusions and to what we make of our own body and so on. But it's particularly relevant because, um, where's my little thing gone? Oh, there. Um, let's forget about this. Um, oddly, OB ears are not more susceptible to it. Let's forget this. But <clears throat> people have wondered whether they could make the same thing and make out-of-body experiences with a whole body. And they have actually done so. The famous paper was called Video Ergo Sum, meaning I see, therefore I am. And what they did was, well, you can see, you can see it here. So you have the, the participant here, and they have on a, um, what do you call it, a head-mounted visual display, which is displaying what comes from this camera here. So the camera is looking here, and it's showing through this wire what it sees. 
to this person here. So what's that person seeing? They're seeing their own back, okay? So now what do we do? Aha, stroke the back. Now what is the person seeing? <coughs> hmm? No, they're not seeing someone. Well, yeah, they're seeing. Yeah, but, yeah they're, they're feeling. They're feeling the stroking on the back here, but they're seeing the stick being stroked in the, in front. So, what do you think happens? As long as it's not you. <laughs> I don't mean that. I mean, I mean that would have worked if we'd carried on. I'm sure. Hmm? What What do you think happens? Any more suggestions? They yeah? Don't Pardon? They don't feel it. It feels like no, they keep feeling it. They, they keep identify with the virtual Exactly. Body. Not suddenly, but they identify with the virtual body. So they tend to feel they've moved forward. They tend to feel they're further forward, even though they can feel it here because they're watching it there. That's why they call it video ergo sum. Their feeling seems to go with vision. So they seem to move forward into the virtual body. There's another way of doing this, which is much trickier to do, and I've, I've tried it. But um, So in this case, what happens is here's the camera, again, two meters from the person. This is the person with a head-mounted display, so he is seeing what's coming through that, that lens. So what's he seeing? This, in this one, it's different because what I want you to do, please, is you've all got pens, I expect, but if not, use your finger, but pick up a pen and stroke your own chest like this, so that it comes up right up here and then stroke your chest. So what are you seeing? Mm? What are you seeing? <laughs> yeah, you're seeing the pencil or your hand appearing <laughs> before your face and then disappearing and then you feel it. Yeah? So what this, um, what Aronson tried to do was to mimic, oh, sorry, to mimic this, um, by this stick goes like that in front of it, like you were doing, and this one is stroking the chest. So now what's going to happen? No, nothing on his back. He'll feel the thing on his chest, and he'll see a stick like this, as though it's going in front of him. No. It's very, very tricky to see this. But just to try and imagine... He'll, I see, him, he'll see it from the... Exactly. He'll see it from the position of the camera. He'll feel as if he's moved backwards into the place of the camera because he's seeing that. Like That's why I got you to do it, because he'll see that, <laughs> and then he'll feel the thing on his chest. So he thinks it's got to be here because vision overtakes it. So he feels he goes backwards to the camera. So in the first case... They seem to go forwards towards the, the virtual body. And in this case, they seem to go backwards towards the camera. And these are both ways that they're not called out-of-body experiences. They're called out-of-body illusions. Um, but I'll just finish with some thoughts about this, which is um, they've done both with a special robotic stroking thing. And then they've even put you in a, an, in a scanner. And they've found some really interesting things. You can manipulate the strength of the effect. And when you have a stronger illusion, you don't react so much to a threat. So they did experiments with somebody having this illusion, and they get a knife and go mm, rather slowly like that. And uh, normally, if it came towards you, you would mm, and have a sweat reaction. But if you're having an out-of-body illusion, you, you don't feel you're there. You don't get that. Lower body temperature, <coughs> reduced pain. <coughs> so they have people put their arms in ice buckets which really hurts, but doesn't do you any harm. And if they have their out-of-body illusion, they don't feel it so much. I think that's important because a lot of kids, abused kids, and you know, have really awful um, circumstances will resort to um, an out-of-body experience to escape. And it's kind of slightly comforting to think that it really does reduce the pain, um, even though it doesn't actually take away the harm done. So <laughs> this is just a summary of how the scientists are looking at out-of-body experiences. It's so exciting to me that now, <coughs> after all these years, there are actually people researching and writing about OBEs in proper scientific literature. Sadly, they tend to say it's failure, disturbed, deviant, uh, hallucinations, and so on. 
I don't think that way. I think it's rather interesting that failure is just an attitude towards it. The fact that it is um, a, a, a neuronal, um, brain-based phenomenon, um, for me, that doesn't make, doesn't make me want to dismiss it. Um, but it's also a skill. I mean, people who can have these experiences at will are, are quite rare. But what, for me, makes it a spiritual experience is this. It hits right at the heart of what it, who, of who am I? All, all my Zen practice, if you like, and all my many experiences with psychedelics and, and with cannabis have been, a lot of them, about who am I? What is mind? What is consciousness? This is, you know, what drives my life, if you like. And that's <clears throat> at the heart of spiritual experiences, because so often the spiritual experience is a self-transformation. It's no longer, I am a little terribly important, frightened thing, you know, you know, but I am actually part of you. Or I am become the tree. Me and the tree are the same thing. And any number of transformations of, of what it is, what the self is. So I think um, out-of-body experience research now is getting at these different aspects of the self, which we know the self, the self system in the brain is constructing. And... Um, <coughs> And they're taking them apart by doing things like the rubber hand illusion and these other illusions. Mm -hmm. So you can think of the self, the brain, as constructing embodiment. I'm in here. First person perspective, I'm looking and feeling from here. Ownership, this is my body. Who is the I who owns my body, by the way? And agency, I'm the one who has free will and does things. All of these collapse in mystical experiences and spiritual experiences. Or at least they're all... I would say agency collapses, the, the, the concept of free will collapses, um, things are just happening, ownership becomes unimportant, first person perspective changes, um, and embodiment becomes um, a, a different as well. And in a way we've known these things, and I'm coming back to dear James, thought itself is the thinker, and psychology need not look beyond. There isn't a thinker as well as the thought. I may pride myself on, I, me, me, I have these thoughts, I decided to do this, yeah. But, as in Zen practice, this, this view of his is far more realistic. There's no place for a soul inside your head, no, of course not. And I like this one from a, a spiritual teacher, um, a Buddhist teacher. Is the self like a unicorn, a mythical being whose representations exist, but who's actually imaginary? And I think that's what I was getting at when I talked about anatta and no-self in, in Zen terms. Yeah, there is a self, but it's a representation of something that doesn't exist. So it has effects within the brain. It's a brain uh, uh, structure. So here's just a few more. Nobody ever was or had a self. Selves just seem to be real and continuous, and they're not. And finally, I'll come back to him. Apply the requisite stimulus, and there they all are. How to regard them is the question. And I think he would probably agree with me in regarding the experience that I've told you about and many others as being spiritual experiences. That's why my answer is yes. This led me into decades of meditation and I think I've, I've found some of the same places as I did before in the OBE. And I certainly regard those experiences that I've had in meditation of time and space disappearing, of oneness and so on, and dropping away of action, not doing, arising, and so on. So if you want to find out any more, um, I gather they have got um, uh, Seeing Myself, my book here, but they haven't got my very short introduction to consciousness. The second edition came out about six months ago. Um, or the third edition of my massive consciousness textbook, which my daughter Emily helped me with. Um, and so you might be interested in those. But above all, I would just like to say uh, thank you for coming to listening to all this. And I hope that I have given you the thought that we should not just divide things up into real or unreal, spiritual or physical. Because physical and spiritual are one. That's the lesson of spiritual experiences. It's not mind and matter separate. They are one. So if we're ever to understand things like out-of-body experiences, this is the right way to go about it. And we shouldn't just dismiss them as deviant hallucinations, but as teaching experiences that help us to come closer to that oneness. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
I think we need a microphone. Um, we've got just over 15 minutes. Um, I will try and keep my answers quite short. Please make sure that you ask a question and don't make a very long rambly statement. But having said that, I did that earlier on, didn't I? So <clears throat> I'll have to forgive you. Uh, do we have the microphone? Oh, apparently we don't. Uh, in that case, would you like to stand up and shout your question? Apparently we don't have a microphone. Oh, yeah, he's arrived. <coughs> No, you don't need to shout. He's come. He's all right. It's all right. Um, right, this is confused of London here. You gave uh, the, uh, you asked the question, does anything leave the body? Yep. Well, how does neuroscience and parapsychology get reconciled? Good question. Yeah. Good question. Tell they me. don't. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and I can be wrong, and I, as I've said, I'll change my mind if the evidence tells me I'm wrong. But it's got to be very good evidence, because I spent probably the best part of 20 years investigating all kinds of different things, not just my PhD research, but poltergeists and ghosts and so on and so on. I do not think there are any paranormal phenomena. I think every single claim of paranormal phenomena has a better explanation in normal terms. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think that spiritual experiences and paranormal experiences are remotely connected. It's, it's, parapsychology kind of claims to be spiritual. People claim that it's more spiritual if you're in your near-death experience you saw the, the shoe in the whatever it was. Uh, I don't get that connection. But yep. you are a member of the Society for Psychical Research? Yes, yes. Well, I was for a long time. I'm Maybe not now. Yeah, I left eventually when I gave up parapsychology, but I gave them a lecture on OBEs a couple of years ago, and I still have friends, many friends in it. Well, I'm still puzzled, but anyway. Oh, are you? Oh, good for you. Good for you, because I love that society, and there were some wonderful people there. This lady here was going to be... Oh. Um, what is your perspective on clairvoyant dreams and um, control sleep paralysis? Um, and... And what? Controlled sleep, controlled sleep right. Um, sorry, what was the first kind of dreams? Clairvoyant. Well, if there are clairvoyant dreams, I'm wrong. Now, you may have had some that seem to be clairvoyant. And, you know, if, if this were 30 years ago, I'd go, right, I'll come and investigate. Uh, yeah, give me, you know, the number, I did one, for example, um, Chris Robinson was very famous quite a long time ago in the Troubles in Northern Ireland. You see, I'm going back now to the old days when I did this stuff. But he had these dreams in which he predicted, so it said, the different bombings and awful things that were happening in the Troubles in, in Northern Ireland. And so and he wanted to be tested by, because in those days I was quite well known for doing parapsychological testing. So I set up an experiment with his help. He helped me design it, in which I had in my study a big box with his name on. And he saw where I sent him a photo of where it was. And he told me what sort of objects to put in it. And... Um, then every <coughs> day I would put one of these objects in the box and lock it all up and we had a proper procedure. And then he sent me all his dreams and he said that he would be able to, he would dream of things in the box, which he didn't. He was convinced, you know, that he was able to do it. But when you actually match them up, they didn't match up. And, you know, you, it gets so tedious. I am just accept that most people in the world believe in paranormal phenomena because very many people in the world have experiences that seem to be paranormal, but they just don't stand up to the evidence as far as I can see. It's well known that somebody who is involved in the experiment can't be objective. Yes. And it affects the yes. experiment. Okay. So I you cannot come to I have been called, I'm, I'm responding to this lady here, I have been called a psi inhibitory experimenter. In other words, when I go in, when Sue Blackmore comes into the lab, all the paranormal phenomena disappear. <laughs> And um, uh, could it be? Well, uh, two things. Mm -hmm. Firstly, in the beginning, I believed it said because I'm not a believer. But in the beginning, I believed all this stuff. You believe me, don't you? That I really believed it. I mean, I really, really, really did. That was my whole aim in life was to prove it. Um, so you can't say that my experiments didn't work in the first place because of that. Because I really, 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 well, really wanted them to work. Uh, so, but this is a very common um, argument within parapsychology that Sue Black was a psi inhibitory experimenter. So there have been tests with a psi inhibitory and a, not, and a psi promoting experimenter. 
Mm, there have been two experiments that seem to show some difference, but most of them don't. So, I mean, you know, that's a scientific question you can go and... But I don't ever want to do parapsychology again because it's so frustrating. All I can say is, from what I know, I don't think there are any phenomena. Somebody else can go and do all that hard work <laughs> and prove it. Susan, uh, how would you answer the question, who am I, based on where you are today? <laughs> and, and has that changed over time? <laughs> oh, that's the easy bit. That's changed dramatically over time. That has changed dramatically over time. <sighs> yes. <laughs> uh, that'll do. Um, George? Um, or I could say, um, oh, uh, oh um, nurse will know, I'll go call her for you. The, the old person's um, home joke. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't say, I can't answer the first part, but I can say that it's changed dramatically uh, and it's not any longer. Um, oh, that'll do, that'll do. Ah! Right. <laughs> Um, ESP is defined as three phenomena, telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, sorry, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition. Those are the three phenomena of ESP, and I have already said that I think all of them don't exist. Um, you can see why. You don't have to agree with me. I don't expect everyone to agree with me, because most people in the world, at every time we know about, have believed in these phenomena, and I think it's all because of dualism. And I think dualism is all because the way uh, evolution has structured us to get around in the world, the easiest thing is to have a model of self, uh, and we're getting this in robotics now, a model of self as an entity controlling the body. And since that's, we've evolved that way, it's very, very hard. And there's a wonderful, another wonderful quote from the Buddha. Um, a, a monk asks him, oh, <coughs> great Buddha, well, I don't know what they called him, Shakyamuni, um, uh, it, does a man um, cry and weep when he learns that th there is no self? And the Buddha says, yes, a man does cry and weep and, and beat himself when he discovers that, that there is no self. And I think this is just a statement of even in those days. It's probably worse now because we're so self-obsessed with, you know, social media and, and, and email and everything and our communications. Um, it is natural to be, to be a dualist. It is natural to believe in communication by telepathy. It's very, very hard. Not at all impossible. It's a long slog to let go of free will, to let go of self as a controlling entity who has a, a stream of experiences. These are the practices which come about through meditation, through mindfulness, and through other spiritual practices. And I think it's a letting go of, of those beliefs. Can I... Sorry, can I... Oh, sorry, you've got the microphone. Yeah, 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 I just, I don't know where you are. <laughs> and, and this quickly follows on from your last question. From my experience, uh, whether these are psychic experiences or traumatic experiences, um, what you're really talking about is malfunctions, when things go wrong, actually when the ba inner boundaries are beginning to fall apart and when all these spiritual uh, practices erode all those inner boundaries, yeah. and you get all these phenomena. Now, my attitude is, and I suppose my, my question is, is it not better for society to enhance psychological health by encouraging firm foundations of orderliness, <coughs> of actually being embodied, of actually being um, perceptually astute and grounded, rather than going into fairyland? I mean, I'm one of these people who is quite psychically gifted. I have no idea about the explanations. Um, I don't think that what you've proven is anything more than you've become a real scientist. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> you're trying to find evidence. Yeah. But as somebody like you who's been on the circuit and on the rounds of psychism and psychometry and this, that and the other, and my sister being a medium, um, I still have no neurological explanation for any of that. So I think we're back to where we started, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to um, answer your part about how we can explain psychic phenomena, because, I, you know, done that, been there, not succeeded, uh, and I don't want to spend my life doing it anymore. But at the heart of the first part of your question is something 
very important. <laughs> Would it be better for society to encourage people to be firmly within their body? Now, one part of my answer is to say, but I'm interested in the truth, not what's good for society. And I've had this argument a lot with Dan Dennis and others about free will, because I think free will is an illusion. And he says, yes, but if everybody believed that, then society would break down. And I'm going, well, like Darwin, you know, and, 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 the, and people were saying to him then, but if people found this out, then it would be so terrible. And, you know, so that's one part of your question. Um, but another, another response to that is, it's a well-known question within spiritual teachings. Uh, uh, it is often said that you need to have a really firm and solid sense of self before you let it go. And some people think yes and some people think no, but it is a, it, 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 it's, it's probably a sensible and safe way to approach it. You do not take young kids, well, actually they do now and do mindfulness, but you don't take them to do deep intensive meditation until they've got a firm sense of self. And you don't take schizophrenic and say, hey, it'd be really good for you to try and have out-of-body experiences. Um, but, you know, so I, I, ag I agree with you there, and I think that's an important question. <laughs> I've just come back from a conference called Psychorance, Psychedelics um, Conference in Tallinn in Estonia. And I was lucky enough to have the most extraordinary DMT experience. And also an, we had one night of psilocybin and one night of DMT. And this was DMT, not uh, DMT, it, dimethoxytryptamine is the active ingredient in ayahuasca. It's a very, very powerful um, hallucinogenic. You can smoke it, and it only lasts about 10 minutes if you smoke it, longer than nitrous oxide, but not very long. And it hits you, like I've done this before, it hits you like, <laughs> and everything goes in like screaming noise, and everything you see turns into monsters, and, and then it's over. Um, in ayahuasca, the reason it's so short is because it's broken down by monoamine oxidase. In ayahuasca, Amazonian peoples have very cleverly over the centuries discovered that if you mix it with some other plant which contains harmine and harmaline and um, tetrahydrocarmine, um, these are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And if you take them in this so-called vomit drug, this absolutely vile tasting, disgusting, awful gloop, and you swallow this stuff, you get six, seven, eight hours of slower, quite mind-blowing and extraordinary experiences. Um, last week I had something completely different, and I think it's very rare, um, which is inhaled DMT with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor prepared beforehand and put under your tongue and absorbed. And then you can breathe this stuff in and it will last 15, 20 minutes, and then it sort of wears off, but you can then have some more. So I was able to go in and out of the DMT experience. And I was told to go within and become very small. And I had the most extraordinarily profound experiences at, at amongst the hallucinations on that. Now, I don't know what your question was, but I'm so full of this because it's last week. I'm like, you know, wow, that was amazing. And not amazing in a way like, you know, like you might see an amazing painting or amazing sunset and go, wow, it's amazing. Oh, this is amazing and actually what it's doing to me. And they talk about plant teachers and I'm going, oh, plant teachers, that's woo, -woo. hang on a minute, you know. There seems to be <laughs> these things here. Is that in any way an answer to your question? Yeah, I suppose it was. Well, no, I think it's mythology. I think the shamans have... I mean, you can tell... You can probably guess what I'd say, can't you? From everything I've said here and the questions you've asked and the way you've responded, you clearly understand where I'm coming from now after 40 or 50 years of not finding <laughs> paranormal phenomena. My, I tend to think that these mythologies are built on a very long, solid training in what these drugs do. When they say that the, 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 the plants are alive with an actual spirit, well, I don't think it's an actual spirit, but I will certainly go so far as to say we are part and parcel of you're sitting in the forest having this experience and you have a oneness with the tree. Well, that's true. You know, we're made of the same stuff as trees are made of. Um, so I, I think I take the mythology as such, but also as helpful because some shamans, not all, um, know an awful lot about the mind and the way it responds to these drugs that, you know, I don't. 
So I'm, I'm a beginner. I've only had ayahuasca eight times. And, and I can tell from the people I know who've done it a lot that I'm really baby beginner. And it's a real tough one. I'm not uh, advocating ayahuasca unless you really, coming back to this man's question here, unless you are really stable and able to and really want to explore yourself in a very tough way and you don't mind vomiting and vomiting and vomiting and vomiting for quite a long time before it stops <laughs> um, but it can be extremely interesting so thank you for uh, asking such a question wave whoever you are because I can't tell where you are oh yeah from the original Buddhist, um, say the Buddha or etc., was their view on Buddhist philosophy as they saw it? Was it was it materialist? Who? What? Buddha. Say, I forget his original name. But oh, Shakyamuni um, or um, Siddhartha. Um, Siddhartha was his human name. I don't know what you mean. His, ne his name his parents gave him. I think. <laughs> Um, was he a materialist? He refused to answer questions of that kind. So people would ask him, and he wouldn't say, are you a materialist? Because that concept wouldn't have been there. Um, I can't answer your question, but I will say that he espoused the doctrine of codependent arising, which is something like everything that happens happens because of what happened before. Uh, no magic, because the, the, the Hinduism and the other spiritual traditions around at the time that he was rejecting all had notions of a soul or a spirit or an Atman or something like that, um, and, uh, and spirits and nature spirits and all of these things which could magically intervene in the world. And he was rejecting all that. He was saying everything happens because of what's happened before. And then there's the whole concept of Indra's net in which everything is connected with everything else and everything reflects. It's a net with mirrors everywhere and everything reflects on everything else. Um, would he have called... So, so he, was, he was working with an interrelated, non-dual perception of a universe in which everything evolves out of everything else. In other words, he was basically a scientist, I think one would say now. But whether he was a materialist, I think he, he would re refuse to answer, but I, I, I don't know. Usually it's viewed as uh, a philosophy of idealism related, I should imagine. I think Schopenhauer thinks the that period of German philosophy mm. Mm. Yes. Uh, well, I'll say this. I am not a Buddhist scholar, and I don't find it at all easy to remember any of the Sanskrit words and everything. I know several very, very good um, Buddhist scholars whom I can ask questions of. I'm interested in the practice. So I will say with some confidence things that happen in many decades of practice, but I really don't, I really can't answer those more technical questions that you're asking. Sorry. But hey, I don't know is always a good place to end up after a long session. <laughs> and I don't.